views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of Blue Ridge PBS, the Virginia Department of Education, or the Virginia Society for Technology and Education. Blue Ridge PBS, in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education and in collaboration with VISTI, the Virginia Society for Technology and Education, is talking to leading educators about what gets them energized and how technology is being used to inspire student engagement. This is Activated Learning. Anywhere that we're building barriers, I just want to think about where we can remove them and how we can make spaces better for kids. Many uh, vendors have sort of realized that they should be prioritizing accessibility and usability in their tools. Welcome to Activated Learning. I'm Tom Landon, Director of Educational Innovation at Blue Ridge PBS. My guests today were recorded at the 2023 VISTI conference, and I think you're going to love both what they have to say and the enthusiasm with which they say it. Katie Fielding and Chris Bouguet are both instructional technology experts, but what sets them apart are the experiences they bring to the conversation. Katie has overcome incredible struggles with her health since childhood, which gives her a unique perspective. And Chris is an instructional technologist who sees his role as being much bigger than just showing teachers how to use technology. And I'm thrilled to get to share our conversation with you today. We're here in the lobby of the Hotel Roanoke at the 2023 VISTI conference. So if you hear some background noise in the background, that's what that's all about. I'm very excited to be uh, talking to Katie Fielding and Chris Bouguet about their work uh, in accessibility and inclusivity and all of these other great things. Um, so. Chris, I'll start with you. You know, what did you come to the conference to learn? Um, I really came to learn what other people who don't have a job title that says assistive technology, what are they doing in the space of inclusion and um, and accessibility? And I've been really encouraged with what, with what I've seen so far. I mean, I just came from a session with two ITRTs. They did not have assistive technology in their title, but they were very passionate about talking about accessibility. And I was like, awesome, the word is spreading. You know? <laughs> and Katie, how about you? What are you here to learn? Yeah, I'm definitely, I think obviously AI is a big topic right now, and I'm definitely here to see how other people will, might be leveraging it to make their classrooms more inclusive, and also to hear about just what other great things are happening in the state of Virginia. I love just getting inspired. I saw the amazing uh, Washington County STEM, mobile STEM lab outside, and I got really excited about that. And so just seeing what other things people in our amazing state are doing to support students and educators. It's a real mix of like, you know, gear and, and apps and tech, but I love the fact that this conference has evolved also to be more than that and it's not just here's a cool thing but here's why this cool thing can be helpful to us right? i think that's one of the fundamental messages that we had during our presentation is that the tech supports good design so it's really about focusing your time your minutes on the design of the experience you want to have and then how technology can provide options to increase or improve that design and uh, so what are you here to share? And I know that's a big question for the two of you, Katie. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I am always here to share some things that have worked for me and students and um, things that I've seen as best practices for making your classrooms more inclusive. And um, I like to speak a lot on the digital accessibility piece because a lot of teachers aren't, you know, trained web designers and aren't trained um, content creators and making accessible content. And so that's something I, I like to share. And how about you? Um, I'm really focusing a lot around multi-tiered systems of support and the idea that uh, a lot of the things that uh, over the years of coming to VISTI and in uh, the experience of working in technology, a lot of the stuff that we think of as assistive technology 10 or 15 years ago has now become sort of mainstream, just how we do for the masses. So stuff that started as a tier three, like only individual kids get this, now it's become tier one. And so now that we've recognized that as a pattern over the last 15, 20 years, now we can actually use that as an approach to focus uh, how, how we design our instruction. It's like, hmm, okay, what do I do for my professional learning? Let's focus on, um, in our school district, let's focus on what are our most frequently used accommodations and how can we apply those just for everybody? Right, Katie, I mean, one of the things that strikes me here um, is 
conversations around you know things that we used to think of as assistive technology. This is for the kid who has visual impairment. This is for the kid who has you know some other issue. I love the shift to this technology is for everybody. It actually helps us helps helps us learn in ways that we might not have expected. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, I think we have to remember that all learners are variable. So all learners are going to need different um, tools or different strategies at different times. And so if we just design our classrooms with the idea and the thought and the floor planning to try and implement as many of those um, options for students and available tools for students and scaffolds. If we do that for, you know, one student in mind, but apply it to everyone, then everyone's taken care of. Chris, how did, you, what was your path to, you know, becoming an a, a, a inclusive de design facilitator? You know, we all start from one place and, and are aiming towards something else. Yeah, well, my actual background is speech language pathology. I was a speech therapist at an elementary school for three years. They saw that I had a sort of a passion around technology and so asked me to be one of the founding members of our assistive technology team up in Loudoun County Public Schools. Um, but over the years, what we've learned is exactly what Katie was talking about, is that we'd be called out to, to, to say, here, we have this an individual student with this individual problem, and we would then, and one of them's classic, is like, we have this uh, worksheet that uh, can't, the text, because it's this piece of paper, um, it can't be read out loud. And we have kids that need the text to be read out loud. We need to make it accessible. Can you help us do that? And over the years, we would say, of course we can. We can show you how to put this on the, on the scanner and hit, hit, hit a button that will uh, do OCR, optical character recognition. But what we've really evolved to is why are you doing a worksheet in the first place? Like, that's not going to make anyone jump out of bed in the morning and go, I want to come to school. All I want to do, I, I want to be here, <laughs> right? So we've, yes, we'll still show you those accessibility tools, but we'll also talk about how, do, how can we design the experience in a way that uh, works for everybody. Yeah, there may be a kid out there whose favorite, favorite thing in the school day is doing a worksheet, but I... Yeah, I'm yet. not sure. I, mean, I don't think any of us look back and say, wow, that was my favorite worksheet I ever did. Or, wow, that was the best test I ever took. We think about those like key um, hallmark experiences, project-based learning we did, uh, where we worked with a group and we created something. And that's the things, we, you know, 25, 20, 30 years ago that I did that I reflect on and think and marked my educational experience. Hey, fifth. 48 years ago or something, uh, my seventh or eighth grade social studies teacher, we did a whole unit on Nanook of the North that was based around a documentary film that's very famous, but also we played all these games of seal hunting. I mean, I still remember making maps and I mean, I couldn't wait to get into the class and that was, you know, that was in the 70s. So yeah. um, anyway, um, Katie, I know that you, you, have an interest I, I don't want to put words in your mouth you have a I, I know that you came to this work partly because of your own personal experiences I want you to share some of that with our listeners sure so I um, I'm a person that has cystic fibrosis it's a genetic lung disease and um, I've been very fortunate to have been benefited by medicine and I'm now you know here as a 42 year old but when I was born, you know, um, medicine was not what it is today. And I was like predicted to have a life expectancy of 12. And so when you're a kid in the 80s and 90s with CF, that means you're in the hospital for multiple weeks at a time. So I experienced hospital teachers. I experienced work being sent to me that was just packets. And But I also experienced some really amazing things like my... Uh, eighth grade English teacher coming and reading uh, the novel To Kill a Mockingbird by my bedside, or my science teacher sending the owl pellet to dissect it, all the doctors helping me dissect it. And so that's really, um, I, when I'm thinking about, you know, what was given to me as like a medically vulnerable student uh, to fill in those gaps of when I couldn't be in school, I think about all the other kids that aren't in school for lots of reasons and how we can be filling in the gaps by just designing inclusive spaces, one that maybe want, make them want to come when they wouldn't otherwise, or if they're out of the space, how can they fill and learn that, that missing knowledge that they're missing from, from their home spaces. Right, and and your your parents really helped 
you always be a more regular you know, yeah, <laughs> no, my parents were very much about making me a quote unquote like normal kid um, my mom is a teacher so I definitely had that you know passion uh, for like education in our home and my, my dad's a scientist so I kind of mixed both and became a science teacher and um, but yeah I think my experiences as a disabled person um, even in the classroom I faced some barriers I went to um, a school in Ohio in the early 90s and this is before we all carried around water bottles you know we all have water bottles sitting in front of us right now uh, but that was not a norm and I also was in a school and I was probably had to get permission to have a water bottle with you. That's where this is coming to. Yeah. Like, so my doctor had a note that I could have water at my desk and I got to sit next to the fan because the school wasn't air conditioned. And literally I would not be like a viable person humanly sitting there to be able to learn anything if I didn't have these two items. And my fifth grade teacher said, I don't know why you think you're so special for things that a doctor had written a note for. And right, as if that was some sort of hack you were using to get get around things, <laughs> yes. right? And as if in fifth grade, like, I wanted to be the weird kid that sat next to the fan and had water. I chose this. Yes, <laughs> as I chose this, yeah. And so just that uh, barrier that she put up, that I wasn't valuable enough to be... And did, was that a public barrier? Did she, like, do that in front of the class? Yeah, there was public things. And I wonder where Miss Smith, not a pseudonym, is today... But, um, but yeah, like anywhere that we're building barriers, I just want to think about where we can remove them and how we can make spaces better for kids. You, you just gave two other examples of, an, of when you were in fifth grade, what was a tier three thing. A doctor had to write you a note. Oh, so I'm going to gonna, ding my bell here. This is our buzzword <laughs> bell. And I'm just going to say some of our parents and others out there don't know. What's a tier three thing? What's a tier two thing? Right. Tier three would be only individual kids get it. Tier one, everybody gets it. So I once heard like smiles are a tier one support. Everybody gets smiles, <laughs> right? A tier three, like think of Braille, right? Only individual kids get to learn how to use Braille, right? So here was something that was a tier three thing. Only one kid, Katie, got to have a water bottle. But over the years, now we just sort of every recognize that we have water bottles. We all have emotional water bottles now, emotional support water water bottles they're everywhere <laughs> that's right that's right and, and it has changed so much right I mean and 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 you know to the point where there are college students with legitimate support animals living with them in dormitories and things like that just it's amazing how much it's a great time to be in inclusive design right so what's getting you excited Chris I mean what are you hoping that other people really um, well, not even other people. What are you, what are you, what's lighting you up? Yeah. Both at the conference, but also in general, like things you're seeing happen. Here's, here's something I'm really excited about. And that is that many uh, vendors have sort of realized that they should be prioritizing accessibility and usability in their tools. And so uh, I think Microsoft, Apple, the big ones, right? Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, um, Google, they all sort of have taken on that as a priority to, to amplify that. So with that in mind, um, the features are there. They're not, you don't have to go really hunting for them as deeply as we used to. Uh, again, they're just, they're this there. Now, some of what Katie and I think we sort of do is help amplify people and l help them realize that they are there, right? Oh my gosh, I didn't know that was there. So I'm really excited about people realizing that, that they can take those tools that are already there and use them for all their kids. How about you? What's um, a surprising thing coming from a millennial, but Gen Z excites me. Um, if you go on TikTok, the creators there are extremely inclusive. They always have captions. They think about the design of their creation all the time. That makes me super excited for teachers to try and bring these elements of accessible creativity um, not just into their own practice, but have students implement that into their classroom creations as well. Um, that's like the next level for me is getting teachers excited about supporting students in making accessible content because Gen Z is already doing it. And so I think it's a really great way to in engage students with content, um, the, the standards content, um, by having them create 
accessible content. So you might say like, uh, so if you have some sort of rubric for some sort of project, one of the things in the rubric isn't just about the content, but it could be, if you're making this thing, make it accessible. Exactly, yeah. And I love that the, when you talk about things like captions, and as a video guy, like that's, I've been dealing with this for a long time, it's a lot less complicated than it used to be, but um, like that accommodation, if you want to call it that, helps everybody. I mean, I, if I'm sitting next to my wife and we're watching a show that I'm not that into and I might be, you know, multitasking, we'll, we'll call it multitasking, on my phone, I can not bother her by having the captions on and I could be watching, you know, something else. I can't watch a Scottish mystery without them. Like, I don't know what they're saying and they're speaking English. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting how you worded that, accommodation, if you will, right? Because at one time we would think of that as an accommodation, but now I'm hearing you talk about it as a design element. This is how we think about when we, we go to sit down and watch TV together. This is how we do it, right? So imagine that same principle with an educator going, hmm, okay, what I used to think was an accommodation for one kid, what if I just designed it that way for all kids? Well, and I like the idea, too, that our desire for those accommodations can change by the day. I show up and I'm normally, I would I would love to, to read or I would love, you know, but today I'm just not feeling it and maybe I want to listen to the reading instead. And, you know, there's not, I don't have an IEP that's telling anybody I have to have this, but if a teacher makes that available, what's that do for the learner? I think it just empowers them. I mean, myself personally, I've noticed that I started doing something a month ago that I had never done before. And now when I text people, I always use speech to text. I'm just talking into my phone now. I don't know what caused me to make this switch. The, the option had been there for a long time, but one day I was just like, Maybe I was multitasking. It was easier for me to just press talk while I was typing on something else and then send that message. It allows students the choice like by empowering teachers to have the knowledge of how to support their students. It gives students choice in how they do things. I think you both touched on something really impactful. First of all, the word empowering is exactly what jumped in my mind as well. But um, something you said earlier, Katie, was about learner variability, right? And realize that we're all, all, there's variances in all of us and all of our abilities. And then something you said is, and not just our abilities um, as a person, but in, in the moment, my, my abilities might change because of the sleep, the eat, w eat, what something said to me beforehand because Miss, mean Miss Smith said this nasty thing to me and now my ability is sort of dropped because I'm, I'm, I'm feeling anxious about what she said, right? So all of that changes all the time, so providing the technology as options for anyone allows them to jump in and use whatever tools um, are available to them to meet their needs at any time. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just struck by what kind of what a, this feels like a golden age, but I know there are still some teachers out there and I used to tell a joke that I'm still going to tell, but now I tell it with a caveat that I understand this isn't fair, you know, but you know, what do you call the, you know, the technology resistant teacher? It's a coach, right? I mean, and, and so, um, or they, that was often said to me as a, what he calls, so, you know, what he calls social studies teacher is also coach, right? The football coach, basketball coach, whatever. But there are still, there's people here doing amazing work and putting so much time and effort into improving accessibility, improving like student choice, all of these things. But it's not universal, right? And I'm sure you experience this in your work. And that's true for a lot of people who are here. What do you do, Katie? You know, how do you help encourage baby steps or help somebody understand that that accommodation is is not just good for the kid, it's good for the teacher because the teachers it's gonna be better for the teacher if they're meeting those needs. Well, I believe no one wants to be excluding anyone, right? They're just maybe not aware that they are or they're not aware of how they can make things more inclusive. So I think to empower students, as I was saying, is really to empower educators with the knowledge of the ways that they can be more inclusive. And then it's the know better, do better. And I think educators are very much of that mindset. So I don't think it's that anyone wants to be you know, exclusionary. 
Um, it's just they don't know. And so I think what, a lot of what Chris and I do is just inform people, let them know. There's this sort of vision of what uh, school is right this uh, sort of if you uh, go in the media and watch uh, school any TV show it's still this sort of desks rows hasn't changed from the 50s right um, and so a lot of educators come into that profession sort of with this craft of like how it's supposed to be and I think what Katie and I do is try and tell them it doesn't have to be that way there's a lot more variability you can build in it can it can look away and feel away um, I think this phrase is starting to become um, more used and I, it's something we've been saying for so many years which is that uh, uh, sort of controlled chaos, right? Like, yeah, come into this room. So if my dad walked into a room uh, the, the way I'd like it to be structured, he'd be like, what? This isn't learning. You're not sitting there listening to a teacher lecture to you for, the, the kids right. are busy. Learning busy. can look different, right? It can look different, right? And it should, it should be, it should be much more active, right? Um, so, but a, a very practical step, I think, is something that we see a trend, uh, especially before the pandemic and a little bit after, has been the move towards flexible learning spaces, flexible seating, if we can get more educators thinking about how do I design my space so it's more flexible, the very next thing they'll do is they'll say, hmm, okay, what else can be more flexible, right? What else in the design of my educational experiences can be more flexible? Do I have to do it that way? Because I just saw by changing the physical space worked, what else can I do? One thing that struck me that a conversation I was having yesterday with a team of teachers is they talked about how, you know, I, I've said this many times, like there's nothing good about the pandemic, except like this group of teachers was of necessity in the pandemic, a group of K3 teachers and their coaches and ITRTs were all brought together virtually to figure out in the emergency what they were gonna do. And they have retained that relationship to planning in their whole school because they found it was valuable. Um, have you seen anything, Katie, good? I mean, again, people died, it's not good, you know, but. I think in many ways, uh, as a member of like the disabled community, we felt like finally, a lot of these things that disabled people had been asking for for a long time were implemented. Virtual conferences. I love that Visti is now keeping a virtual component where those that may not be able to come for a huge variety of reasons can still participate in Visti virtually. Um, so things like that. Um, I've always been masking as a person with CF. We've masked for a long time and um, now I don't get the looks that I used to and that's like nice and freeing in many ways. Um, you don't have to explain it, right? You don't, you don't, you don't get called out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the pandemic was hard in so many ways, but I think a lot of disabled people were like, finally people understand are now experiencing some of the stuff we've experienced for a long time. Yeah, one giant silver lining to the pandemic was uh, the, the giant leap forward we made in accessibility. So many more, we were never as busy uh, at, at talking about accessibility in the assistive technology world. We thought this was it, like this was our watershed moment. Like so many people were checking for accessibility before they put things online. We, we, we do seem to have experienced a little bit of amnesia right now where right. people are like, oh, now that we're back in person, we don't need that anymore. We don't no. have to do that anymore. Yeah, no, right? you need to do that, right? You want to, um, but more people than ever knew about that. And the second thing that I think is a silver lining is a question I've asked every educator that I got to talk to during the pandemic and since is, did you, we, you go back to March 13th, we go to emergency distance learning. Oh, that day, that just having, just saying that date <laughs> gives me the willies. But yeah. Did you know any students that actually did better? And every single one says, yeah, actually, there were some kids that like, because they didn't have to go to a place where they felt stressed or anxiety, they could work on their science work at two in the morning if they wouldn't, if they wanted to. They didn't have to do it at 9 a.m. for a 90 minute block, and that's when I work on science. Flexibility was actually built in for a number of students. And so the takeaway there is, I think to Katie's point is, let's, let's not lose that stuff, let's keep that flexibility that we learned uh, during the pandemic. I um, was, reading Catlin Tucker's newest book and it caused me to reflect on my own teaching. I've been out of the classroom for a little while. Um, and I, there was something she wrote in there that I just remembered that feeling on my first day as a teacher when I kind of couldn't believe they were letting me do this. And I was very excited. 
And then I closed the door to my classroom after the first bell rang on that first day. And I had like such a, I was so stressed out. And I had one mentor teacher who'd been assigned to me, but I didn't feel like I was a part of a team. How important is, you know, a lot of the work that you guys do is by its nature kind of putting people together in groups and how does how do you think that helps with the transfer of knowledge from those old heads who've been doing it for 35 years and that person who's just about to close the door for the first time? Yeah, well bringing it all full circle here to your first question about what do we want to learn at VISTI? That was the other big thing about VISTI is that uh, you, know, you, you work in your individual school and you work in your individual school district and you have your kind of immediate family, like the people that you can rely on. But then if you think about what social media has done, the positives of social media has brought us together. So now it feels like this coming to VISTI is sort of like a uh, bringing together the extended family. You know, you only get to see everybody at Thanksgiving, right? Or at the holiday time, right? Uh, same thing here at VISTI. It's like this big um, homecoming of like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you and I haven't seen you, but we are aligned in our mission. So there's a greater feel here at the VISTI conference to, of bringing people together that way. Yeah, I think uh, organizations like VISTI really allow people to expand their professional learning community. And that's actually a part of the ISTE standards is are those professional learning like engagements and your personal growth w because of those communities. Um, so I think that, you know, whether it's VISTI, whether it's your content specific community, whether it's your assistive tech community, uh, find a community where, that feeds you and that you can give to. Um, and you don't necessarily have to give on day one. Like it's okay to take a little bit, right. a lot of bit, maybe if you need it. And then um, when you're like ready, give to that community. And I think that's a really powerful part of of conferences like VISTI. Yeah, you are not alone. There's someone out there that is definitely working through the same struggles you are, um, and it's so worth it right, to make those connections. I think it's, you know, we have badges that say presenter on them, and I just, I, you know, I, I, I like the idea of, of recognizing that everybody who's here, if you've made the decision to come, you've got something of value to share, right? I'm learning things from all kinds of people. I'm not. I'm not just here to deliver, I'm here to learn, right? And I think that's exactly why Chris and I planned a workshop more than a hour long talk, is because we didn't want to just talk at people, we wanted it to be a collaborative space for people to learn from each other. Yeah, we literally have a podcast that people are listening to right now where it can be a one way sort of thing, right? Uh, we have YouTube videos that you can do that. So when you come to a space like this, where you're in, uh, in person, make that count by having conversations with people. Last thing, um, and I could talk to you two forever, mm -hmm. but you know that I do want to talk about that a little bit. Like, how have you seen conference presentations change? Like, okay, I'm teaching, I'm here to present about choice boards or whatever it might be. And I went to a session about that yesterday, and guess what? We got up and you know did them. We stood up, we moved around the room. That's a lot different than the model that you used to see at conferences, which was one PowerPoint or Google slide presentation after another. Um, how important is that, do you think? I mean, I think that's another product of the pandemic. I think after the pandemic, when people are together, they see the value of that interaction and the collaborative time, and that's how they want to spend their time together. We can take in content from one another anywhere we are, like Chris just said. We can w listen to podcasts, we can watch videos, we can uh, watch a webinar, but when we're together in a space, a little bit more magic can happen. Yeah, I, we have the great fortune of going to conferences, other conferences, and I can tell you that they're not all like Visti. Like, so that there are certainly those places that sort of, you go and it's a sit and get sort of experience. But the conference leadership here at Visti, I think, helps select people that, let's, let me show you how we can have more engaging, um, interactive experiences that are ultimately more memorable, and they, ultimately you have, you, you take more stuff away from than just kind of sitting and getting. All right, well, uh, Chris Bouguet and Katie Fielding, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk to me, and I look forward to more conversations in the future. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. Yeah, okay. thanks for having us. Activated Learning was created by Blue Ridge PBS in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education and in collaboration with the Virginia Society for Technology and Education. 
Produced by Tom Landon, Director of Educational Innovation at Blue Ridge PBS, with a lot of help from graphic and audio designer Jay Prater, podcast studio producers Andy DePew and Kurt Schruth, and Vice President of Education, Dr. Rose Martin. Our theme music was composed and produced by Ryan Champney and Dr. Matt Katatechea of Visti. Copyright 2023, Blue Ridge PBS.